Hi, this video is all about the keys that we use on British Geological Survey maps. They're called Generalised Geological Columns and they contain a wealth of geological information about the area that's being represented on a geology map. So it's important to understand how these geological columns convey the information uh, about the area. This is an example taken from um, an exam map from 2018. It's actually the generalised geological column for the BGS map of the Telford area. Now, if we look at a small part of this map, and let's blow it up a little. This shows part of the sequence um, of the rocks that are exposed and represented on the Telford map. Now, the most fundamental uh, bits of information we can get from this is which bed on the map is represented by either the colour or the symbol that we can see on this map. So you can see um, the Lidebrook sandstone there is represented in a sort of a yellowy colour with the uh, symbol LYS. The Little Wenlock Basalt is a red colour and marked with the symbol B. Notice how we've got sedimentary rocks and lava flows shown together in the same column. Now, as well as showing us the type of rocks, we also have some information about age. You can see that the age of uh, these beds is given in the key, so we always know how old these rocks are. We also have, because these rocks are drawn in a stratigraphic order, um, an idea of the sequence. So the oldest uh, bed represented is always shown at the bottom of the column and the youngest bed at the top, entirely as we'd expect. Okay. Let's look at another part of this column. This time, let's look at this bottom right area here, which is perhaps slightly different. This part of the column, uh, which shows intrusive igneous rocks, also shows, shows some Precambrian volcanics, but could include rocks, for example, like uh, regionally metamorphosed rocks. Shows us, again, the colours and the symbols that represent these different rock types. What we don't have this time, though, is them drawn to scale. So there's no um, time order for these rocks. And notice how they're all the same, um, uh, the same thickness on, the, on these boxes. This is fairly typical of rocks where we either don't know or it varies too much uh, in terms of the thickness of any rock unit that's given. Or in the case of the intrusive igneous rocks, uh, the age, for example, doesn't fit into the geological time scale that's shown on the rest of the column. Okay. If we look at how these age relationships uh, can actually be represented on the map, let's focus on this part of the column. Now here we can see a sequence of beds of different ages. If we look at boundaries like this one, for example, between the Lidebrook sandstone and the Carboniferous limestone, you can see there's just a horizontal line drawn to represent these. That implies that these units are conformable. So the Lidebrook sandstone was deposited and then uh, immediately afterwards without any sort of break in deposition or without any uh, significant events occurring, the Carboniferous limestone is laid down on top. You can also see though that there are unconformable relationships. Some of these are very obvious. There's a clear break in time between the Cambrian period below this unconformity 
and the Carboniferous period above the Young Conformity. These are marked as these sort of wavy lines on a geological column, and often with the uh, word unconformity put in there to really emphasise it. Now, as well as the really obvious unconformities, such as those that uh, between geological periods, we can also see unconformities within a geological period mark. So the lower Conley sandstone and the Shinton shales are both Cambrian in age, but there's still an unconformity between the two. There's this, a break in the record and a gap in time. If we now look at some of the other features that are shown um, on the geological column, particularly looking at thickness of beds, because it's another key piece of information that's shown. If we look at the keel beds from the upper cold measures of the Carboniferous, we can see that these are actually drawn to a scale. This particular bed is drawn to a scale of 1 to 2,500. So if we measure the thickness of the bed that's shown on the key, we can see it's about 2.5 centimetres. Now 2.5 centimetres at that scale gives us a thickness of 6,250 centimetres, or in other words, 62.5 metres thick. So we can work out, using the scale, how thick these beds might be in this particular area. As well as showing these to scale, there can be other ways of showing uh, thickness, and particular changes of thickness, on these, on these geological columns. If we look at the coal measures, from the lower coal measures and the middle coal measures of the Carboniferous, we can see it's a relatively complex picture in this area. But if we focus on a, just a few key beds, for example here, we can see the green bed, maybe representing something like a sandstone, um, has this triangular shape. The grey bed, maybe representing a, a shale, um, sort of fits around that. Now that implies that the thickness of that sand bed in this area changes. And in fact, it, it reduces to nothing. So the sand bed doesn't persist across the whole of the area. We see a similar feature here with this, what we call marine band. So a band of marine fossils within the coal sequence, which clearly doesn't uh, stretch across the whole of this area. This can be down to a number of different reasons. Perhaps change in sea level, perhaps um, uh, just only a, a small depositional environment, say from maybe a river or, or something similar, um, mean that we're not getting our uniform thickness of beds across the whole area. We can even see some details of uh, the coal measures here. The big flint coal here, which you can see is listed as changing thickness anyway. Um, shows that the uh, coal seam actually splits in some places. With each of these methods of trying to show the sequence of beds, the cartographers are trying to represent what those beds are actually like. There are some other areas that we can look at on our key. Um, recent beds or quaternary beds uh, are often shown uh, like this. Now, not every map will have quaternary beds shown. Solid or bedrock geology maps, for example, will usually omit this detail. Um, drift or superficial maps will show this. Again, we have different colours uh, and crucially different symbols to represent these different uh, recent deposits. You'll see these draped over the bedrock geology on some maps, or in some cases, it may even show these symbols sitting above the symbol for the bedrock. So they're not in any stratigraphic order at all. And have no thickness shown. The final 
part of the key to any geological map are some of the geological features. Now, these are always shown in, in, in black and white. There is a, a variety of these that are used over time on geological maps. There are some uh, common um, features. There are, for example, uh, where we're unsure of a bed, it tends to be drawn in dashed lines. Where we're sure of a, a, a boundary between beds, that might be a solid line. But it's important to check the map that you're actually working with. This will always be given to you for an exam map. So we can see, in conclusion, that there's a wealth of geological information on a generalized geological column. We get the type of rock um, clearly shown uh, with the colors and symbols. We get the age of that rock given to us. We get the relative age in terms of where it falls in the sequence. We get um, information about how thick that bed can be and, and whether that thickness will change, as well as uh, any additional information about geological structures and features within the area. It's crucial, if we're going to understand the map, that we also understand how the key works. Anyway, remember to come up with your interesting question and bring it along to class. I'll see you then.